Uh, welcome to Maison Française. Nice to see so many of you here. Thanks so much for coming um, for this screening of Waka Girls by Teresa Trower and Dalbert, who will be um, fully introduced in just a moment by Norma Philippe. But I wanted to thank Teresa for making the trip here to, uh, to be with us to discuss her film. And this is the closing night of our film series that started last Wednesday. I see some familiar faces in the audience. I know some of you have seen some of the other screenings. It's been uh, quite a journey. Um, really, really interesting how the films in the series have spoken to each other and some of the discussions afterwards have, have echoed. We've had the, the pleasure of having five directors here um, joined after the screenings in discussion by uh, an invited scholar from Columbia and Barnard, so that's how we are going to conclude this evening as well. Um, we are finishing with, I think, one of the movies that's uh, perhaps more joyous and um, ending on a very positive note, and it's also the only film, other than the Black Girl, that is filmed in Africa, so that adds another, another interesting note to uh, the other films in the series. I want to thank of course, thank all of you for coming. I want to thank all of our co-sponsors of the series, including the School of the Arts. For those of you who may not have been to the other screenings, I just want to mention that the part of the reason for organizing the series at, at this time was uh, to time it with an art exhibit that is at the Wall Gallery at the Lenfest Center for the Arts, called Posing Modernity, the Black Model from, from Manet and Matisse to Today. So if you haven't had a chance to see that exhibit, it, it's at the Wall Gallery up at the new Lenfest Center for the Arts on 125th Street, and it will be up through February. So it's a wonderful exhibit to see in connection with the series. I want to thank all of our other co-sponsors, Cultural Services of the French Embassy, the Institute of African Studies, the Institute for the Study of Women, Gender, and Sexuality, Institute for African American Studies, Hamas Center for the Humanities, and European Institute. Um, this was this is a, a project that a film series that took a, vi a village to build in a sense. A lot of people were involved in it, and I want to, in, in particular, to thank Noah Philippe, the, the series curator, who's always such a um, such a pleasure to work with. There's a lot of work that goes behind uh, planning a series like this. We've exchanged hundreds of emails over the past months. So, um, Nora, thank you so much for being such a, a rich series and rich set of conversations. <laughs> and we, we want to thank Barbuda Somohoro in, in Absentia, who was here for the first several discussions, um, and uh, it, it was wonderful to have her contribution as well. I want to thank Gavin Bradley, who was at School of the Arts, Alex Cutler, and, and Marceau Ferron for helping us here at the Maison Française. And on that note, I am going to now turn it over to Nora. Um, you know that there will be a discussion following. And well, actually, I, I do want to introduce, before turning over to Nora, our discussant who's joining us this evening. Her name is Aposilia George, and she is Associate Professor of History and Africana Studies. And her research and teaching interests include urban history of Africa, the history of childhood and youth in Africa, and increasingly, she's turned her attention towards Lagos and issues of gender, ethnicity, migration, and the records of diverse, of reverse diaspora communities from the Americas, the Caribbean, and other regions of West Africa. She's the author of Making Modern Girls, A History of Girlhood, Labor, and Social Development in 20th Century Colonial Lagos, which won the Edu Snyder Book Prize from the African Studies Association of Women's Caucus in 2015. And she's currently at work on a project uh, called the Ecopolitan Project, a digital archive of family history sources on migrant communities in 19th and 20th century Lagos. So thank you so much for being here to, to join us for the discussion. Following the discussion, because it's our closing night, we'll also have a reception. So please uh, stay with us for some wine and cheese. And um, thank you again. Please join me in welcoming Nora. And then she will, uh, I think we'll hear briefly from, I was say, uh, from um, Teresa Trower in Delberg. And then we'll have our screening. Thank you so much. Good evening. Um, so thank you again for your patience. It's the end of the series, so I've prepared just a, a very short speech. Um, 
So it's the end of a long journey for me and the beginning of a, hopefully a long American journey for the films that have been screened. I hope that you know other screenings will be organized in the country. Um, so first, um, I would like to thank Shannon here. Um, it means a, a huge pleasure to work with. Um, uh, again, such a series require a work at, at least on, you know, for six months. So um, uh, thank you for your, for your kindness, for your enthusiasm, for your trust. Uh, it's extremely valuable. Uh, and uh, the series could be made with such freedom and with such production means too, uh, without your support. So thank you again. And um, again, Mabula Sumaru has been a, a guide. She was, a, 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 as, as, you, as you've seen, um, a guest scholar, guest narrator, but also a guide really, in conceptualizing the series and, um, and fostering really a transatlantic dialogue. So um, it's been filmed, so thank you. Thank you, Mabula Sumaru. Um, I also wish to thank Alex Cutler, um, who's been um, uh, for his constant and efficient work throughout the events and his patients too, uh, and Gavin Browning, who invited several films to be screened at the National Center of the Arts, all the scholars who generously participated in the series, and the directors, Amandine Gay, Alice Diop, Sylvain Lanchère, who traveled all the way to New York to present their work and meet you. Um, I must say um, that I'm seeing some faces uh, that have been uh, uh, there before um, uh, throughout the series. I'm saying that the feedback uh, we, we received has moved us and given heart to continue to show such films here and made us feel it was indeed an urgent conversation to foster. Um, I would also like to stress how meaningful it was to organize such a series here in New York because we talk to people who come from all around the world and who have nourished a rich black Atlantic perspective during the Q&As. Um, and now, so, I would like to welcome Teresa Traudelbert. You are the last director to join us tonight. Welcome to La Maison Française. And, and so she has survived a, a, a nearly one day long uh, trip because of the snow from Stockholm yesterday. So it's really a miracle. She's, she's with us tonight. Um, and um, let me note that uh, Wagga Girls is um, it's the third um, New York City screening tonight, so it's almost a premiere. Um, so I'm very, I'm very proud of that. And you have actually studied here in New York at the New School um, before graduating from the Stockholm Academy of Dramatic Arts, and uh, you also um, graduated with, um, from the Royal Academy of Arts in Stockholm with a Master of Fine Arts. And apart from being a television scriptwriter and producer, um, Teresa Trodolbe has directed Taxi Driver, uh, which she shot in Dakar in 2010, and Wagga Girls, um, that was released um, in 2018, actually, in France, and it's her first feature next film. Um, the film has been, um, uh, apart from its theor uh, theoretical uh, release, has been shown in many, many festivals across many continents. Um, and uh, in Sweden as well, uh, which is the country where you live. And your last short, The Ambassador's Wife, also shot in that Wagadou, premiered at in Toronto this, this very year. Um, last paragraph of, of my speech. Um, I wish to show Waga Girls and to end the series with this screening in order to leave the French territory and to tackle a wider perspective to change the standpoint. Um, Teresa Traudelberg is Burkinabe and Swedish, and um, she has explained in interviews that she made Wagga Girls, many, among many other reasons, but also to reconnect with a part of her life, because at the age of the protagonists that we will meet in the film, she actually lived in Wagga She chose French to shoot the film, um, which is a dominant language in Burkina. Let's recall it was a French colony until 1960. But it's far from being the only language spoken in the country. And uh, in several interviews, she, she stressed that um, Wagga Girls, which is an international production made with an international crew, tells a story about Africa that is generally not told or shows African female protagonists who are generally not, do not generally reach um, theater screens. That's how the Western media uh, um, uh, framed it. Of course, Teresa Traudelberg, in doing, uh, in making such a film, uh, connects with with two generations of African filmmakers who've already worked on the representation of, of African women protagonists. 
Um, but it's, it's true that the fund participates in reshaping the representation of African women on Western screens, um, and of course in Burkina as well. And on this ground, Wagga Girls fosters our conversation on global blackness and how black women are represented in films, um, uh, also on French screens, and we'll tackle the, the question during our, uh, our, our conversation. Let me, let me end, before turning the microphone to you uh, with your words, I wanted to capture that sense, sense of humor, that thirst of emancipation, that daily life and that strength. The political change that the country was going through um, uh, during the, sh the, the shooting is never far away in the film. And we know that in Burkina Faso, the youth upheavals have played a critical role recently. So your film says that young women are key, and I think it was a good way to end our series, certainly. So please come and join me. Thank you, Nora. Uh, I'm going to keep it very short now. Uh, I just want to say, you know, um, welcome. And I'm happy that so many made it here on a Friday evening. Um, and we're going to be talking after the film. So I just want to say that I hope you will enjoy the screen. Thanks. Congratulations for your film, and again, I'd like to welcome her to the So, my first question goes to Teresa. Um, I'd like to, we'd like to know, I guess, um, how you first you started writing the film. Was it because you wanted, to, um, you just you found out about the school, or because you met some of the young women? How, what was the first, the starting point of the film? Um, this film uh, was actually, uh, uh, it was very, it was an intuitive decision. <laughs> so it wasn't something I was planned a bit than before. Uh, so I had, I, I did a film that was, uh, I don't know, of course, months working with it, but I mean, from the beginning the starting point. Uh, I had done a film uh, called Taxi Sister uh, quite a few years before, which was about a, a woman who drives a taxi in, in uh, Dakar. And when I was in Burkina Faso, just like you mentioned before, uh, I grew up between Burkina Faso and Sweden because my, my father is Burkina Bay and my mom is Swedish. Um, so I was in Burkina Faso, and someone that had seen uh, Taxi Sister said that, oh, women in cars, Teresa, <laughs> have you heard about this school? Uh, and I wasn't interested in filming. I was like, I was, I was in a completely different place and state of mind at the time. Uh, but I was very curious about this school, about this initiative. Um, so I went. So I went to the school, and once I was there, I fell in love with the place, and I met the, the students, and, and I decided I wanted to spend more time there. So I started spending a lot of more time there, uh, and eventually I started seeing uh, that this would be a place that I want to also film, uh, and also uh, a class that I want to film. Uh, so once I decided I wanted to do a film, uh, it was more like I, I fell in love with everything around it, and uh, it was also because it was very different from from because uh, when I did Taxi Sister, uh, which you probably haven't seen, <laughs> but like I said, it's about a woman who drives a, a taxi in Dakar. It's one of uh, five taxi drivers out of five thousand men, and she decided to to do this anyways. And uh, I was studying film in Sweden at the time, uh, and I was, uh, for my last project was the only time that I actually decided myself, got to decide myself what, what film I wanted to do. So I talked to a friend of mine, Valerie, who lives in Dakar, 
uh, that I talk to about everything all the time. Uh, but then she told me about the Taxi Sisters. So I wanted to go there, I wanted to film, uh, and I met Puri, uh, and I followed her in her everyday life. But this film was very much about a grown-up woman who has done a conscious choice to be a pioneer, uh, and who I followed her in her everyday life, trying to understand who she is, but also trying to understand how it is, just filming how it is in her everyday life. Uh, with all the support that comes with her choice, but also all the hardships. Um, but what I found really interesting when coming to, to, uh, to this school is that it was not about uh, grown-up women having done a conscious choice about being a pioneer. It's about uh, very young women that have ended up between chairs in society and that have, for different reasons, ended up in the school uh, becoming pioneers. So it was, it's a class with extremely different personalities, extremely different histories, extremely different dreams. And they're, they're in this situation where they're becoming something that people have opinions about, that they themselves have opinions about as well. And, and they're still in an age where you're trying to figure out what you want to do and who you are and how to act in different situations. Uh, and just like you mentioned, I lived in Burkina Faso at the same age. Uh, and I find this time in life very interesting. Uh, the, the time right before changes. Um, how, how old are they? They're actually between 16 and 23. So since this is a school where, where uh, like in the class, it's it, different reasons why they ended up there. So it's everything from yeah problems in the family or teenage pregnancy or for different reasons. Um, so I, I felt that this time, the last year of school, uh, which is also like their space uh, before going out in this professional life or grown-up life, is really, like for me, very interesting. It's a time before big changes and you can kind of feel it. It's always in the back of your head, you know that next year everything is going to be different and we don't know really how. Uh, but also I found it very fascinated with their friendship, which is also uh, the kind of group that I felt like I never really found, <laughs> but I got to be a part of. <laughs> so so I, I was in this school for a long time, uh, for, before for filming. Long, yeah. How long did you? Not a long time, but a few months. Uh, so they were like, what are you doing here? <laughs> like, what is it? And I was trying to explain to them, like, once I decided to do a film, uh, that I really would want to, you know, just see how the school works and I, that I was a filmmaker and... and um, Did you show them Taxi Sister? I think I said Taxi Driver actually when I sent it. Yeah, Taxi Driver is a great film. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I didn't know that. <laughs> no, no. Oh, that's that's okay. okay. <laughs> no, yeah, yes, but once I found the class, it was actually the, the one class that was less interested in me filming. <laughs> Because the, the, it's very different, just like it is always in classes, different feelings. Um, and in some class, in one class really wanted to be in the film. But this class was not at all interested. But I felt like it was very, um, like, a, a, the, the class that I wanted to film. And in order for me to, to do a, like, a, to, to also gain their trust, I felt like I had to also show them how I have made films before. Um, so when talking about whether I could, they wanted me to film them, if it was okay, I also showed them the films I had done. So it also becomes like a cinematic contract, like they trust me as a filmmaker. Sorry. <clears throat> but also um, that uh, I told them that I wouldn't show the film before the day are the school is finished. Uh, and I also told them that um, so, so it was like, you know, it's, it's trust that also builds over time. So they tried me and they tested me all the time as well. Like, what well, time are you coming tomorrow? Okay, 10. Okay, she's here at 10. <laughs> you know, it's, it was always... Um, so it's also for them, me, I'm kind of a strange person as well, because I'm Lukina Bay and Swedish, and uh, 
You want to say to an outsider? And yes, and I'm a grown up and I'm a young person and I was talking to them and hanging out and then I was also talking to the principal, you know, so for a long time I was like, who are you and can we really trust you? You know, like, and then with time they knew that, okay, you're not going to tell the principal, you're not going to, you know, like, yeah. So it was, it was really something that grew over time, yeah. Because um, from the start, your project was to follow them until graduation, and it's, it's a question actually. And and the second question is, um, they say this beautiful thing that is actually confirmed in the film, but n not so much at the same time. Is that they spend more time at school than elsewhere? Um, so did you know from did you tell them from the start that you would follow them in every aspect of their lives, or was it more about the school that you realized that they indeed actually had another you know another life? No, well, for me, I was really interested in, in them. Uh, in school and outside of school, in filming inside and outside of school. So I was very open with it, that that was my, what my, I wished for. But for me it's also very important that we have a collaboration and that there's a respect, uh, of course, of also where you want to be filmed and not. So, so even if my wish was to film uh, at home a lot more, because a lot of people ask, like, why didn't you film more? Oh, uh, and a lot of times it was not because they didn't want to, but maybe because someone in the family didn't want to. Um, so, so I filmed uh, at Pintu's place because I was welcome there to film, uh, and at Chantal's place, but uh, in the other houses I wasn't. I couldn't film, so I filmed at school. Yeah. And also, it was one girl in the class, Nathalie, who, was, who didn't want me to film her in the beginning. So I had like personal conversations with everyone, and I was completely fine with this. And after a few months, she said, okay, now I trust you, now you can film me. So then, yeah. Uh, so I'll, I'll ask you the microphone, because we have only, well, actually, I can give you mine afterwards. So, um, I was Sidney George, um, you are a specialist of girlhood in a country that is near Burkina, which is Nigeria, and um, especially in the colonial era, and the two countries actually became independent the same year, uh, but have of course a different story. Um, I was wondering which uh, bridges, um, or to sum up, which parallels, or of course contrasts you can draw with uh, the girlhood you've studied um, in, let's say, yes, um, colonial and post-colonial uh, Nigeria. Well, my, um, my book that was mentioned was about girl hawkers, girls who sell in the streets, and um, in the early 1940s Lagos, there was a law passed to criminalize hawking. So really the book was interested in like the criminalization of working class girls' labor in the city. Um, very different from what's happening here because we see that, I don't know if Sifian is a government initiative in Burkina or a private initiative, but we see girls being encouraged right into these new forms of labor. So I was interested in like where Sifian was coming from. But um, you, can, you can answer that because I have a totally different yeah. line of conversation. Yeah, yeah it's not kind of mental. Yes, the rule is that they can ask each other. OK, so um, what I wanted to know actually is my work is also in Nigeria, which if any of you are interested in African film, know has a large film industry. Burkina is known very much in African cinema for having like the Ifisa oldest. Fisa Wekagu. <laughs> Sorry? Fisa Wekagu is. Yeah, it's known for having, yeah, like the oldest film festival um, on the continent, one of the oldest in the world. You know, Fest Paco starts in 1969. And it was presented for Yeah, it premiered in Fest Paco. Yeah. So I'm just interested in what it's like to be a. Uh, African woman filmmaker uh, making films in a place that has such a deep history with um, cinema on the continent, and also, you know, having grown up there up to us, like your teenage years at least, um, how do you think Burkina shaped your visual language, your aesthetic, your approach to film, your interest in film, um, things like that? 
No, that's, that's a really interesting question, because for me, Festival was like my dream to, to be able to scream at, at Festival. Uh, and it's because it's been, like, ever since I grew up, I've, I've been going to Festival, and it's the huge event in the country. <laughs> and uh, so, so it also formed uh, why I know that there's a lot of cinemas. And there's inside cinemas, outside cinemas. It's just cinema is a, a big part of of life. So every Sunday I was going to cinemas with my dad, uh, buying like shoe guns and yeah. He was about a Bollywood film actually at the time. Um, but so so cinema was always a part of 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 a reality that it's actually yeah. And uh, so uh, so I think it definitely. And it is so with Ivo, for example, who is a big uh, filmmaker who came out. Then now there's Apolline Traumé as well. Uh, there's a lot of filmmakers uh, in Burkina. There's this openness, I feel. Like it's um, not so like uh, judging in a way. Like a lot of people go to a lot of film and open to like what to see and talking and continuing the discussion afterwards. And at Festival, for example, the big opening is at the stadium and it's packed. The whole stadium is packed and there's music and there's everyone is there. It's like a big part of the the, the city mm. uh, and the country and everyone is involved and it's for free and you know it's it's really really uh, do you feel very proud when you're there? Yeah. I noticed you paused when I said as an African woman filmmaker. Like, is that a moment? A little bit. Or did I imagine that? Like, is that a moment for pause for you? Is that something that you think about? Like, what do no, I do? Okay. Yeah. Um, you had another question. <laughs> yeah. What are your thoughts um, about the frequent conversations they have? about their own freedom, their choices, um, uh, for instance, as a hairdresser. Um, um, you, you, you almost imagine sometimes that you kind of provoke them or that you wanted this to happen, and the same time it seems completely spontaneous. would like to have your thoughts about these things. Yeah, I think that freedom thing was really uh, important. I noticed that um, Samira's mom, I don't, I don't know what the hell been to. She keeps talking about how she, if she hadn't had a daughter, she'd be far away. If she's always talking about being somewhere else, and I guess I could be anywhere, but um, it, you know, couldn't, I couldn't stop thinking about, you know, youth and Africa and the whole narrative of youth and Africa and migration now is about young people trying to be elsewhere, trying to go everywhere else, and trying to get out of their countries, maybe even trying to get out of the continent. And as she was like making that refrain, like, my mind went there. So, um, you know, is there is there is there a story about like young people leaving in Burkina today that we see in other um, Not so not so much actually. And I think also when she says like I would have been far away, she refers to the um, uh, to having a child so early uh, and perhaps having to go to the village and, uh, yeah, not leaving, not leaving the country. I think it's more about, like, uh, yeah, like, like she would have not been able to stay in her family. <clears throat> Sorry, it's my throat. Um, um, <clears> throat> so, no, it's not about leaving the country. Uh, because that's what freedom represents for so many like, young people now. It's like just the ability to move, period, right? You can move in, move out, move away, oh, move yeah, back, yeah, but think, just to move. Yeah, and especially for a lot of, uh, in this class, it's to move out of your home. Because uh, a lot of girls in this class are not even with like the parents or where they were as children because a lot of them lost their parents that like they talked about like, as well. So maybe they ended up at an auntie's place or a friend to the family or but a lot of time that also includes uh, a lot of yeah not always ideal situations and also being in this age when you want to actually decide where your life and 
it becomes sad. Which I think a lot of young people from all over the world can relate to. It comes to a point where you just want your freedom, like you say, and decide and move them. Yeah. And same thing about marriage, and this is a question for you too. Um, it's, yeah, marriage is at the same time something that is a threat, something that you desire for all, almost all of them. Um, and in, in the, the way they, um, the, the terms they use, I don't, the subtitles might have been complicated to understand here. It's to be out, outside, to be inside, that is to say to be married or not to be married. Yeah. The, the cool, the the don't, outside, the don't, the, 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 yeah. And uh, it's, the, 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 the film really is all, really often about this, about this yeah, desire and, and fear. Um, would you have any, any comments to, to make about this? And maybe also I would like Teresa to, um, to know if you had actually planned that motherhood and marriage would be so present in, the, in their lives. Maybe start with that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting, because also since, like I said, I work very organically with, with them and what's happening in life. Uh, for me, at the same time, when I started, I was single and, <laughs> and yes, and when I ended the film, I had three children, <laughs> and I had, uh, and I was married, which I, yeah, I never expected to. <laughs> so a lot of things happened in my life, and going through all these pregnancies, but also miscarriages, like it was a lot of things happening in my life, uh, which. They were a part of as well because we work together, but which also changes what you see and what you react on, and also the editing, what you. So I and also, so so I think definitely what happens I, in my life reflects uh, what I see. Because you know how people talk about documentaries. Is this really the truth? <laughs> and for me, it's very obvious as a filmmaker. It's what I. I capture and also like choices I make in the editing together with what's happening in the room and the, the people. So it's it's really something. Yeah. So no, it was definitely not something I expected. And also that for me I got pregnant is something you can't really plan either. So yeah. How long was the film like? It was like a three year project or something? Yeah. Yeah. And then I spent a lot of time before that and after I spent a lot of time. So yeah. Um, I was just interested because um, cause you talked about how you know the girls were at a they were at an age that was a crucial turning point for them, but actually they're in the wide range, and um, but they were also at an age that was a crucial turning point for yeah. you. So the film started out being kind of about adolescence and this turning point, and yeah. it ends up being about motherhood. Yeah. So um, so it's interesting that you say that that is something that. That transition also kind of mirrors your own transition. Definitely. But also what was happening in the country was something that I couldn't plan. Mm -hmm. Because when I started filming, uh, it had been the same president, Blaise Compaoré, for 27 years. Mm -hmm. It's a very, it's been a very stable country in a lot of ways, and very safe. Mm -hmm. It still is very safe. Um, but when we started filming the first scene, uh, not the first scene, but the first time they go out at the smoky, um, uh, concert. Smokey is an activist uh, and musician, extremely popular. Uh, and he turned. Yeah, from yeah, that's great. Because when we filmed this, it was before the everything that happened in Burkina Faso. 2014. It was yeah, 2014, 15. Uh, and then you started filming in 2014. Yes. And yes. then it was 2015. Yes. So even then, just filming, I was I was reacting on that. Okay, it feels like there's a lot of things happening, uh, a lot of questions about corruption, a lot of you know, uh, people are really talking about this and are asking for changes. Mm -hmm. And a few months later, there were the demonstrations. So it was one million people demonstrating on the streets, um, which peaceful demonstrations. Uh, so. Um, the president that had been there for 27 years uh, left the power, but people didn't really know where and for how long and if it was permanent or not. But it turned out into a transition government for one year before the democratic election. Mm -hmm. So this was the same year as they went to the last 
school year. So it, also the country was in changes and development and transition. So when Chantal is looking at the TV, it's just like everyone knows that uh, transitions and are the hardest part of Everyone is fragile within transitions, and I, it's the fragility in it that I was also interested in. But, um, but I still didn't want to make a political film, because a lot of people ask me, like, why don't you go out and shoot the revolution? And, uh, because that's uh, what I've been the film that people want to see. You know? But for me, it was very important to stick with, with uh, but the, radio the class. The time, the radio. Yes, but it's the, exactly, because they're just, because I asked them, I'm like, are you going there? Because then I will come with you. And they're like, no, I'm not allowed to go. Or no, I don't want to. Or no, that's for someone else, it's not for me. So then I didn't want to force it on them, of course. Uh, so, But it's still just being in the country, and uh, it goes into your life when they go to the concert, when they watch TV, or listens to radio. So I used the political part more as a backdrop in their film than changing focus, yeah. What are your comments about the fact that television is in French? Um, and that French is everywhere. And well, it's everywhere. Like, yeah, it's a Francophone country, right? But the girls are also speaking other languages, and they're all just mixing it up from what I saw. Um, but I was interested in like how your film is, in your view, plays in different spaces and different linguistic spaces, like here you're in New York, it's anglophone and, you know, um, and uh, but probably you've also played a lot in francophone countries with francophone audiences in Sweden. Um, so I wanted to hear a bit more about how you think it plays differently in different places. Yeah, for me something that I would have done differently is to spend more time with the translation, especially the English translation. I feel like there's a lot of parts that was, uh, big parts of the films, I feel, are uh, a little bit lost uh, in the words. Uh, like but what? Yeah, now I have to think of like what's a big issue that you might completely miss? Like yeah, no, it's, it's just like, just like nuances, nuances, you know, like, uh, and trying to work with a translator who was an academic, but but for me it was like certain things that I know what they mean, even though these are the words, and then it becomes like something else, and then trying to and not being like now I would have been more like this is how it, like how what I think. But then I was like, okay, well, we'll try to find a way to, you know, and certain parts I should have just been, yes, more direct. And when it came to the French translation, it was a lot better, and when it came to the Swedish, I was a lot more, like, I, yeah. So the translation part can be a, a problem, but otherwise, it's, I, I feel like it's, a, it's really a universal story uh, that people, it feels like it's a lot of the, the questions that comes up and reflections are, are um, similar. But it becomes, in Sweden, for example, uh, it's been talking about representation. Mm. While in Burkina and in a lot of other countries in, in Africa, that's not what they're interested in, representation. Mm. So it becomes, of course, different. Uh, in and in France, it was, uh, it was very different because it was very different crowds when, when I went to also to the screening. So sometimes it would be uh, really like the cineast. Then it was very much about like the technique and the editing and the process. And, but also sometimes it would be, it, it would completely depend on, on the crowd. And, and sometimes it would be younger people. And then it's very much about like, what are you doing now? And, and what really happened here? But it's, it's funny because uh, some things, some uh, screenings, people will be like, they're really good actors. <laughs> and, yes, and I can, I can also understand it because I, I worked with a technique called, which is also second takes, because I only had one camera. So sometimes when something has happened and we weren't there with the camera, I would ask, like, could you do it again? Mm. And often, more, most of the time, they were like, no. <laughs> Or they'll be like, okay, but they'll be like doing it halfway, so it's like nothing new. 
but but sometimes they will do it again. So, and sometimes you can also feel that it's like, but I would never tell someone to say something or do something that they have already done or that they don't feel like doing. So. Um, you had another question now, or can I ask a small one? About the technicians, about the farm work. Um, I don't know if you noticed the name of the, um, of the editor in the credits. Um, she's actually French. Alexandra Stas. And she's the editor of I'm Not a Negro by Helen Beck. So she's a wonderful editor. Um, she's not, there are two editors actually. And I was wondering, um, yeah, how actually you edited the film, because I guess you had a, a, a huge amount of, of, of footage, um, and what directions you took while editing, and also I'd like you to talk about the music, because there's a story about the score. Yeah. Yes, the, the editing was actually a really long process, uh, because uh, I filmed it wanting to not be like to be about like the different like diff not having only one person's yes. story but having the whole class and especially in Sweden I don't know uh, exactly how it is here but it's very oftentimes it has to be character like one person going through this way <laughs> going through this and two thirds of the film this happens which is the turning point and then so so. It was really like everyone I tried to bring into the, no, not everyone, but we, we ended up. Uh, yes, because I have the whole class and I really wanted the whole class and I wanted fragments. I want to do a film with fragments and, you know, film the Quran. Uh, but a, a lot of the feedback and also wanting to try to see how you can work with the film, ended up uh, editing towards Chantal, uh, one person, uh, which for me was always like something I thought, I thought would come back to bringing the others afterwards, but then it became almost like too much focus on one person, uh, which is not the film, because I didn't film it that way, because then I would have followed Chantal <laughs> for two, all these years, you know. Uh, so it's something that you can't really either make afterwards. And, and it felt like, yeah, we tried to work with it. Uh, and then we just put the film away for a few months. I had a baby. <laughs> I didn't, I tried not to think of that for a while to just be able to see it again with fresh eyes. Um, and then we, I decided to work with Alexandra and she just, with me, she was like, oh, this is your film the Quran. <laughs> and I was like, but that's what I've been trying to say. It exists, you know, it is possible. Because uh, a lot of people are like, no, that's not how you, no, that's, it doesn't work. <laughs> but then she's like, yes, it works. And for th we sat for three weeks together and we did the film. So so it was like we worked with the material that was actually, that's how it was supposed to be when I, that's what I was thinking about when I shot. So it was instead of trying to construct, you know, like, yeah, but sometimes you really have to try and so, to be able to trust what you, your initial instinct is. But it's also important to work with people that you feel like you, you understand each other. <laughs> but also for me, in the production was really important to work with the Burkina Faso production team as well, and, and to to have a Iga, uh, a woman doing the photography. Uh, and uh, a sound technician from Burkina Faso, so a mixed team, which was also really interesting actually, because Iga doesn't speak French, and uh, and also they were they were had gone to completely different film schools and had different ideas of film. Because Iga, she's really like she doesn't talk a lot, and she only uses like ee, ee, little sounds and fingers, you know, like when she points, yeah, and. Uh, Blanche, who did the, the sound, she was like, what are you saying? <laughs> you know, like she was more used to like big, big, yeah, big gestures and big like orders and you know. So, so it was very, uh, we, it took a while and then we found a language for the three of us that worked. Uh, 
But it's always like that when you work with new people, no matter who you are, to, to, to be able to move in a scene without... Like yes, exactly, yes. Knowing when to back off and come close and yeah, communicate. With Knox, I was working with Knox on the like on her shoulder when she I want to close up or come back, you know. Yeah. And the score. And the score is my, my dad. My my father's a looking at me musician. Um, so it's so I worked with his music that I found from recordings from the seventies and eighties. So yeah. So so that's that's been really in so many ways, it's so unlike. And then we actually we worked it. Uh, we did it like in a new version with, with the in dubious studios and, and stuff. Up. Because it was all recordings from a, a place, so it wasn't recordings on a CD. Mm. So we had to to work. Yeah. Should we open up? But it actually, I mean, I didn't even know because it's in Dula which is the language you speak in uh, Bobo, which mm -hmm. is the next big city in Burkina Faso. Mm -hmm. But um, so I didn't know what he was saying in the beginning. Uh, and it turns out that he says that uh, in the end, all we need to do is to stick together, hold each other's hands, <laughs> pretty much. You know, like the solidarity, you know, in the end, that's what it's about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's, I thought, at the end, the most important thing is love. Yeah. Yeah, that's a uh, math and things. Before opening, you, you had actually one comment that was really important. It was about the reception of the marketing of the film, like, you know, especially in France or Bingo. So it's been it like, oh, this is a film that shows new types of, you know, free African women. And, and you were commenting, well, like, yes, I know, because at the same time, there have been, you know, so many novels and films that show this, this type of character. So maybe you would like to add something about this. Them, yeah. yeah, what we were talking about earlier is um, the frequency with which we hear work out of work on Africa being described as new. Mm -hmm. So um, this is going to give us a new lens, it's going to give us a new story, a new approach. And um, and you know, once you've seen that or heard that so many times, you have to really wonder. How new is it, right? Um, and or who is it new to, right? So some of us do consume a lot of African cinema, and um, a wide range of representations is not new. Um, so um, you know, given that you are Burkina and you show in Burkina and you work with Burkina crews and you're part of that whole kind of film history in Burkina, but you're also now based in Europe and different. You're in conversation with different parts of Europe, and now you're here. I mean, here in this festival, we see a kind of synthesis of an American reading and a French reading of the film, because the series is all about blackness, actually, which may or may not be the lens through which the film is read all over the world, right? Um, so maybe come back to that kind of question of how the film gets read in France, or Sweden, yeah, we talked about that, and it's and I totally agree. <laughs> uh, and it's really uh, like also, I also mentioned that it's been a feeling of also protecting the film because it, it's a lot of media sometimes want to put it in one direction mm -hmm. or simplify it or or also asking questions like so tell me about the. Uh, with the women in Africa, <laughs> and also using Africa, you know, all the time as a, especially in France, actually, like Africa, you know, like a country. <laughs> uh, so, so all the time, it's it's a lot of times it's been kind of like I'm a filmmaker. I wanted to film these women because I'm fascinated about this part of time in life and about them. Uh, uh, yeah, no, so it's really a. Uh, like, so I, I, can kind of of I can speak about this, mm -hmm. and I can speak about their situation, and, and then. Yeah. But a lot of times, as a documentary filmmaker, there's a lot of like, expectations to also be the ambassador of the whole. You know, and I think it's better to involve more people in the, the discussions to actually be able to deepen those, those uh, discussions mm -hmm. as well. 
and then, yeah. So this is that's why I'm so happy to have these talks. Oh, that's a good segue to involving more people yeah. in the conversation yeah. to people in the discussion as well. Yeah. Yeah. I just wanted to ask uh, um, a couple of questions with one thing. Uh, did you, uh, when did you finish uh, actually filming the, uh, the movie? When, uh, and uh, since then, have you kept up with any of the young women? Uh, and the uh, third question related to that is, do you have any plan to go back and see how their lives have progressed, or what's that, you know what's happened to them, maybe five years um, in the future, something like that. Yeah, yeah, I finished filming really bad years, <laughs> but I think 2016, maybe, because we're 18. Wow, am I? No, yeah, <laughs> but yeah, 2016. Um, and uh, I, but then we were editing as well. Uh, and then, uh, yes, I have contacts every day actually on Facebook, and uh, and I'm going to Burkina in a month. So I, I, my family lives there as well. So I, I will go back and forth all the time. So I'm going in, yeah, soon. What? Uh, half of the class are working in, in Garage. Yeah. And the, the one that she visits, did she hire her? Or? She actually got the option and she was really going to, but then it was a little bit too far. She ended up deciding to, to get something closer because she got another option. Chantal, yeah. But Chantal actually just got a child as well. Yeah. So it's been, a, yeah, there's a lot of things that's happened since the film in a very short amount of time. Yeah.
that seemed to be so unique. The school to which the girls went. Is it unique in Rupna? Yeah, there are two, two schools. So it's, so it's, um, but it's, it is, uh, there's only two schools, so there's not that much. Uh, but it has turned out to lead to jobs and, uh, who formed it? Who? Yeah, it started as an uh, initiative, so it's actually it's not governmental like you mentioned before, which also meant this year of transition and a lot of schools were uh, closed and the school continued to function. So it's uh, completely, um, uh, uh, how do you say, individual, individual yeah, completely uh, independent. So it's different organizations and different uh, uh, individuals as well who continuously support it. If they pay, yeah, it's actually like a social, like if you have, that's why, because um, normal schools cost a lot more, so this is more of a, uh, if you have a reason, like something happened to you, and uh, then like a social, what, how do you call it, social? Like corporate sponsorship? Yeah, welfare, right, exactly. Then, then we can get it to a very lower price. And, Oh, they do have to, students do have to pay something. Yes, something. But it's so it's, like, it's a bit of a hardship. It can be. Well, like you could think about it. It's not something you can just try and not. No, it's still yeah. Time. But it's it's very much less than a normal school. Right. So it's something that's possible for for someone, but it's still a little bit they have to to pay. But it's not like yeah. No, if you have, yeah. That's not having that. It's 50,000 same fan. How much is that? Like, fun. What would be the salary? For instance, their future monthly salary? Uh, uh, actually, I have to check. Yeah. yeah, but it's 50 before I give a certain specific number. But 50,000 same fan is about $400, maybe? No, it's, how much is it in dollars? Sixty. Six. Well, someone can do the conversion. Wow, we move numbers today. Okay, okay. Uh, six twenty. Twenty dollars. Twenty dollars. Fifty thousand. I don't know. Fifty thousand. Yeah, yeah. Very good. It's rich. Uh, okay, it's about uh, six, 40 or 50 dollars a year. Yes. So, <coughs> it would be only me. Um, yeah, I must have. What percentage would that be? Oh, it, it's a very small percentage. Yeah. So, it's, it's definitely not something that, I mean, it's, it's a sum, but it's not uh, something that you. That will prevent you to be able to go. It's not like I think the normal school is about two hundred thousand fifty or something. Yeah, um, let's not get into numbers, but it's, it's it costs. <laughs> <laughs> also, there's a few years ago. I don't know how it changed now. Yeah, so I'm not going to find the same numbers. But it costs a little bit, but it's not uh, it's not it's it's very small. Yeah, it's very small. Yeah, it's very small. Yeah, it's very small. Yeah, it's the reason why. Uh, uh, you go there, it's because it actually leads to jobs and you can make fun of yourself as a professional. And it doesn't cost you so much to go there as well. So, um, so I had a question about uh, a specific dialogue uh, in the film that struck me. So there is a scene where uh, the girls are talking about one of them wearing hot pants and uh, the other girl responds saying, but her thighs were as black as mine. And it seemed to carry a negative connotation that it didn't seem to be a compliment. And you also mentioned that you know you remember going to the film festival where you saw Bollywood films. And I come from India and I know how Bollywood is notorious for being a champion almost of colorism. So is that something that's prevalent? No, it was a joke. <laughs> and when I screamed with the keynote, everyone was laughing at that. So it's like it was, right, but 
But they don't point to each other out that, that it could be a joke and they could also Exactly. I mean, it could be a joke that covers, you know, that covers up like a, like a deeper political issue. But I just wanted to ask in general, if colorism is prevalent in Burkina Faso, if that's something that... Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. This about color or about the fact that she was half naked? Well, they had different jokes, like one joke was yeah. like, so tight, one joke with almost your butt, one joke with like, her lap was very... Now this, I think it's really interesting what you say, because exactly, there's different layers, and also that's what I thought was interesting to feel, because he like, uh, what are they joking about, and how, how does that reflect society? And there is colorism, definitely, there's uh, uh, everything from uh, and there's definitely also uh, sorry my my brain now after not sleeping for a long time but um, but also with what you wear and you know yeah respectability and also being in the age where you're trying yourself out in different situations. Um, I just want to know more about what the reaction of the young women were to the film after seeing it at the premiere. No, it was it was good actually because I was um, they were saying like why did you edit out so many parts <laughs> like why is it not longer <laughs> but but it was good. It was good. Chantal was sitting next to me and she was holding my hand really hard when she saw the part where she's doing a phone call. She's like, ah, did you have to put this in? And then I was like, don't worry, I'm not saying who it is. And, and you're saying afterwards that it's not about you. And then she was like holding it and then she heard herself say that she's like, okay, but So, so that's like, uh, but anyways, it was good, it was good. But the t-shirts, I was also like, kind of uh, worried about what they were going to say more actually uh, but they were also fine with all the parts that they haven't seen <laughs> happening in the school when they're not there <laughs> in the classroom. I was really struck by the way you portray the, the head is the headmaster. Mm. It's a very tender kind of portrait. Like yeah. you show him carrying the baby. Yeah for, yeah. And for me it's very uh, very much like uh, uh, I recognize uh, also with you know, like getting the getting to actually uh, after 1960, like he has huge pride in his work, and and uh, he really wants them to understand what it means. You know, like he really and this feeling of like they also say that they're closer to him, uh, uh, to the teacher, than to a lot of uh, their family members even. So it's it's a very close. Relationship and actually, the the scene with the child at the in the math test is in the beginning was ten minutes long because the the, the child is in different forms <laughs> and it just travels and I feel like that's how it is you know uh, and how it should be <laughs> but everyone yeah it's like this community feeling more yeah. one last question. I will be back to Sweden in a few days, so maybe. <laughs> if you want to, you can mail me and I'll look up all the numbers <laughs> and send it to you. <laughs> That it's great to uh, meet you and to encounter kind of new generations of um, African filmmakers. I see a lot of them in the kind of independent film circuit, and um, so there are African women out here making films. You know, lots of them are making films in New York. They're making films all over the world. Um, but it's great to you know, it's great to have the time to talk about this work with you and. Um, you know, to think about how your voices collectively are amplifying and what new aesthetics or interesting things will come from um, a new generation of African women voters.